103 North Water Street. There it is right there on the corner. Oh, Jesse James back. No. Oh. Yep. And it may or may not be open, but at least we see the outside of it, if nothing else. Michelle, nice to meet you, Michelle. I'm Chuck. Okay, now this building was built in 1858. Okay. It is the only building left on our square that was actually built before the Civil War. All of the others out there have been replaced a time or two. The floorboards are all original. So is the pressed tin ceiling. The distorted glass is also original, um, as well as the wood trim in and around the windows. Uh, the vault and the safe are original. Uh, you're welcome to walk around take and um, take a look inside of there. The safe cannot be removed from the vault because the vault was built around the safe and then the building was built around the vault. The safe weighs about 1,800 pounds, its wheels do not swivel, and the end of the safe is three and a half inches wider than the doorway. Uh, the furniture in the room is not original. After the robbery, the bank closes and everything is eventually sold. There is no banking insurance to save the place. Between the robbery and the museum opening is a 100-year time span. A few different businesses were in and out of here, each one remodeling to suit its own needs. It took about a year to get the room back to this condition, removing layers off the floor and the walls, getting a drop ceiling down, finding the appropriate furniture, getting it all restored, and building two pieces. The counter here and the large desk are reproductions. The other pieces date 1865 or earlier. The original counter was longer than this one. We are required by law to get people out from both ends in case there's an emergency, as well as be wheelchair accessible. The original counter would have come to where this railing ends, leaving a space of no more than 14 inches to get by. It was all the way to the window on the other side, and the countertop actually fit into the notch of the window, so it was lower than this, and there were no bars. We have bars here today simply because everybody expects to see bars. Hollywood feeds them garbage. Yeah. We eat it right up. <laughs> Hollywood wouldn't know the truth if it came up and thumped them on the nose. They jumped over this too. Right. Yeah. Now, um, uh, this bank was called the Clay County Savings Association, and it was robbed at 2 o'clock in the afternoon on Tuesday, February 13th of 1866. This was only 10 months after the Civil War had ended. Now, during the war, this part of Missouri supported the Confederacy, so now we're occupied by Union soldiers. They are here removing Southerners from positions of, of power and influence government, law enforcement, churches, schools. When Northerners are moving into the area, they are appointed into these positions, whether they can do them or not. Uh, fighting is still popping up in the area. The soldiers are doing their best to keep that under control and out of the town. The soldier, their citizens don't like the soldiers, but they're a necessary evil. Um, and the soldiers can't leave the area until they're replaced by other units or the government law enforcement that's been newly appointed are finally capable of doing their own jobs. Or is it the Union soldiers yeah, that was during the war. That was Pinkerton's, wasn't it? This is after the war. Yeah. yeah. Uh, wait a minute. The Union soldiers um, uh, hanged stepdad from the tree, raped mm -hmm. mom in the house, beat Jesse mm -hmm. to, within an, mm -hmm. to within an inch of his life. That was Union soldiers. Mm -hmm. The Pinkertons raided the house nine years after this and threw mm -hmm. a bomb in, mangled, her, mangled mom's arm so badly that it had to be amputated and killed a little brother. Didn't burn down the house, but mm -hmm. you know, in the movies they kill mom, burn down the house mm -hmm. because the railroads are coming through and mm -hmm. blah blah, garbage this and garbage that. Mm -hmm. You know, mom outlived four of her eight children and, her, and all three of her husbands. Yeah. And she's a tough old broad. Yeah. Now, <laughs> uh, uh, let's see. There were uh, the weather was really really bad at the time mm -hmm. of the robbery. It was February. February around here is not the pleasant month. Um, several inches of snow on the ground. The snow was coming down fairly thick and heavy, and the wind was beginning to just whip around and howl out there. But you never see the snowstorm in the movies because you can't recreate that in a Hollywood backlot. Mm -hmm. That's why you see tumble gu tumbleweeds and sweaty guys. Mm -hmm. um, now, uh, the uh, soldiers are having a hard time holding their posts because of the weather, so they're constantly going in to get warm, and others are coming out to take their place. Riders are coming in, and others are going out to take their place. Mm -hmm. Just movement constantly of the soldiers. Uh, 
excuse me. Uh, very few of the soldiers actually knew each other because they were all from so many different units. Uh, that and the snowstorm worked right into the hands of the James Gang. At some time before two o'clock, a dozen or so men who had been guerrilla soldiers for the Confederacy come into Liberty. Um, they're coming in two and three at a time from different directions, and they're all wearing Union uniforms, blending in perfectly with the movement of the true soldiers. Most of these men uh, take up positions around the square, mingling in with the soldiers, talking with them, distracting them from the events that are about to happen. Only three right over to the building here. One stays outside to hold the horses. Now, in the building, there were no customers, but there were two employees. Uh, the head cashier, Grenup Bird, was working at the writing desk under the two corner windows. And in the corner behind the vault door is where uh, the assistant cashier would have been working. That was William Bird, Mr. Bird's 18-year-old son. Now, um, after the robbery, these two go over to the sheriff's office. They make their statement, give their descriptions. On the way back over, they're hearing everybody else's versions as to what happened in here. Well, who else is in here? Nobody. So nobody knows. Mr. Bird is afraid that the nonsense that these people are talking is going to affect what he knows to be the truth. So when he gets back in here, he pulls some sheets of paper out of the drawer and he writes it down. Uh, we know because of Mr. Bird that at 2 o'clock, two men entered the building through the south door. He described them as wearing heavy union overcoats and they went to, and they went to the stove to warm themselves for a while. Eventually, they step forward. One man slides across a large bill and asks for some change to be made. William hurries forward, but upon reaching the counter, guns are drawn and all of the money in the bank is demanded. William stumbles backwards. The robbers are over the counter, one after each cashier. William was ordered into the vault, not moving fast enough. He was hit on the back with a gun, shoved inside, and the robber pulled a large cotton grain sack from beneath his coat, and he forced William to fill it with the contents of the safe. The other robber had his gun on Mr. Bird and began demanding the greenbacks, the paper currency. Mr. Bird nervously pointed to the tin money box on his desk. The robber emptied the box, forced Mr. Bird with him towards the vault. The robber hands the money inside to his partner and tells Mr. Bird to step in. Mr. Bird begins to make excuses, but he is told with a gun to him that if he does not step in immediately, he will be shot down, so Mr. Bird hurried right in the vault. The robber inside grabbed the sack from William, backed out, told the cashiers to be still, and closed the vault door. The robbers exit the building, doing whatever it is they need to do out there. Mr. Bird can't see it to write about it. We don't guess. But all of a sudden, these men make sure people notice them. They take off going east, shooting their guns wildly, rebel yell, bullets flying, an innocent bystander is shot and killed. That young man's name was George Weinmore. He was 17 and a student at William Jewell College, which is still here in town today. Uh, George and a classmate had stepped out of a business that was across the street. They're just walking down the hill, heading back to the school in this weather. The bullets start flying. George takes one to the chest, and he dies in his friend's arms. Teenagers with guns just pulled a robbery, and an innocent was killed as they fled the scene of the crime. Their horsepower was flesh and bone. Today it's all mechanical, but it's still the equivalent of a drive-by shooting. In the vault, Mr. Bird and his son were aware they were not locked in because the bolts did not slide into position. Mr. Bird begins to push the door very slowly. Once it's open enough that he can take a peek, the men are gone. He and his son run for the window. They lift it. Mr. Bird leans out, waving and yelling that the bank has been robbed. And he wrote in his statement, as we were rushing from the vault door to the window, we saw several men on horseback passing these windows, going east, shooting off pistols. He was very lucky that he wasn't killed as well. No one is ever convicted of the robbery or the murder of the young man across the street, and the money stolen is never found. The gang steals from here just under $60,000, which in today's money would be around $4 million. No banking insurance. The board of directors have no responsibility. The customers have no rights. Um, so if you want your money back, you jump a horse and you chase it down. Posses were made up of citizens, not all men. This town of nearly 4,000 people had one sheriff and two deputies. But in the movies, a town of 100 people has 40 lawmen. Please. <laughs> They didn't deputize people like you see in the movies either. Um, now, even though the board of directors did not have responsibility, they promised their customers that they would do what they could to help. Um, they didn't expect to get much, uh, but after liquidating all of the bank's assets and even some of the men selling off properties that they own personally, find a banker that will do that for you today, um, every customer was given a little over 60 cents on the dollar for what they had lost. We're only guaranteed 10 cents. So... Yeah. <laughs>